Hey everybody, it's Allie, and welcome to our YNR chat for Sunday, February 3rd, 2013. The week started out kind of surprisingly, I thought, with Sharon going to pay a visit to Chelsea. In fact, Sharon shows up at Chelsea's door, and Chelsea's immediately put off. Adam isn't here, go away. Sharon forces her way in, practically pushes through Chelsea to get in the door to try to convince her to take Adam back. Which, either Sharon is completely selfless and really wants what's best for Adam and wholeheartedly believes that that's Chelsea, or Sharon was just going to check out the competition and figure out exactly how over the marriage was. I'll leave it up to you as to what you think her true intentions are. I think Sharon had good intentions, but it, it certainly wasn't her place, and it didn't help things whatsoever. Nobody, why would Chelsea take Sharon's word for it. Nobody wants to have their husband going on ex-husband's sort of mistress coming to them and asking her to take him back. It's uh, it, it didn't help. And uh, to boot, Chelsea realizes that the problems in her marriage with Adam extend beyond Sharon, and in fact that the larger problem is that Adam is someone who is constantly wanting to seek his father's approval in a weird way, whether it's beating Victor or helping Victor or something, Adam is a little bit of a satellite around Victor. And really what he wants at the end of the day is to be accepted by his father and welcomed into the family. And Chelsea pegged it because that is very, very true. Adam has daddy issues to the core of his being, and that is never really going to go away. That's always going to be a part of him, and Chelsea would always be competing with that, which is impossible. So, <sighs> Sharon leaves, and she later goes to meet Adam um, at the athletic club. They're sharing a drink. I can't remember if they met there on accident or on purpose, but they're sitting there having a drink at the club, and like, there were, Sharon's boobs were so prominent in the scene, it was almost overwhelming. As, as if, even if Adam was trying to get over Chelsea, this was, must have been very, very helpful in the moment. You know, I mean, it's easier to forget about Chelsea when Sharon's boobs are sitting right next to you. <laughs> All of her business attire has been beautiful, gorgeous, I love it, but, <laughs> like, very seductress, too. Like, she's, Sharon is using what she's got. <laughs> And Adam was definitely looking. <laughs> but they're sitting by the fire, and they're having a drink, and having a pretty open conversation. And Sharon is trying to counsel Adam. She's trying to help him decide what it is he wants, and more importantly, where it is that he needs to go. And she actually tried to get to the core of what the problem is. You know, if you're, why is it that you're holding on to Newman Enterprises? Because if it's that you want to help the family, then help the family. Why don't you include the family? And that, it struck a little bit of a chord with Adam, and it, you know, he really took it to heart, and he really thought about it, but he had uh, this uh, just very kind of a revelation moment where he realized, okay, so even though they don't want me, I'm supposed to want them. Even though they're not helping me, I'm supposed to help them. And it was a different vibe for Adam, even because he's transitioned away from being the evil villain character and he's not exactly the angel saint anymore, he is still trying, I think, to do the right thing. And even though his marriage is falling apart and he doesn't have anything in his life, he's tr I think he's trying to build something. Because meanwhile, at the house, Chelsea is leaving him. She has packed 
all of her things. She is doing a, a, a look around and a shutting out of the light and a, a, a walking out the door. And it was a very extended scene, you know, like this is the end of the marriage. It's the end of her living here. Chelsea is closing one door and moving on. And then probably the next day, she shows back up at the house looking for Adam to get money out of him. I didn't get the impression that she called or anything. She just stopped by the house to ask him for money for the business, which seemed very just counterproductive. If she needs to move on with her life, then move on with her life. Don't keep going to Adam for money. And as expected, Adam tries one more time to get her to come back to him and and you know doesn't want it to be over so tries to convince her and she is she's totally shut down she's not hearing it she's not having it she just wants to take her money and leave and that's what she did he writes her a check for something like I think it was half a million dollars or something and she just takes the check and leaves and I, I feel so bad for Adam I probably shouldn't he has made this bed and it is his time to lie in it, but there's just something about thinking of him sitting alone in that big empty house or sitting alone in that big empty office and not having anyone that just makes me want to take him in my arms and just have sex with him until he feels better. <laughs> is anybody else getting that vibe? I don't know. I just maybe maybe I um, attracted a broken a broken man. I don't know, but I just wanna just wanna make him feel better. <laughs> Even though he dogged Chelsea, he did dog her. There's no two ways about it. And he dogged Sharon too. So I probably shouldn't be feeling as much sympathy for him as I do, but he's hurting, and here's the thing, I just don't know if it's that he wants Chelsea, or if it's that he just doesn't want to end up alone, because when he had Chelsea, he was pushing her to the side, he was shutting her out and not grieving with her over the loss of their child and he was turning away and turning back to Sharon and so why did that happen in the first place if he really truly wanted her and only her it was only after Sharon denied him and after he started feeling this loneliness that he went back to Chelsea and tried to make things work and I think she saw straight through that and that's exactly why she's not going back to him now Sharon wants very, very badly <laughs> to be there for Adam in every way. She wants to be in his arms. There's no question about it. She is feeling totally on top of her game now. Her, she's she's uh, centered. The medication is doing its job. And she's doing a great job at work. She is, in fact, holding things together in a way that Adam really isn't. Adam has fallen asleep in the office. He's not getting any sleep. He's feeling as if he has to be on his game 100% all the time. He's strung out. He's missing meetings. And Sharon is the one that's coming in and really f moving things forward, meeting with clients. And it's recharged her. She feels energized and her confidence is higher than it ever has been. And she, I think, I really think wants to help Adam. I think she has a genuine desire to help him the way that he helped her, but also she wants to be in his arms. She wants to be back together with him. And I think a large part of the reason why she isn't is because the therapist has told her that it's not a good idea. And I guess I don't get this because Sharon had a meeting with the therapist this week and the therapist was pretty much encouraging Sharon to date, but told her to stay away from Adam. So why tell her to date, but not, but then like not encourage her to be with the one that she wants to be with? The therapist doesn't know Adam. The therapist doesn't know the nature of that relationship. I don't know if the therapist just heard the bad things about the relationship and assumes that Adam is a destructive force, which he may very well be. But I just thought it was odd that, I mean, the therapist is kind of pushing her back into dating, but not the one that she wants to be with. I don't know. So 
Sharon even confessed that she really wants to be with him bad. <laughs> and last week, she had a fantasy about having sex with him at the office. This week, Adam had a really intriguing double fantasy. I, at first, I knew, I knew a fantasy was coming. <laughs> I could tell like a fantasy was happening because Chelsea, at the beginning of it, walks through his office door and she's wearing this bright red dress and she's looking at him with love eyes and I knew, yep, this is a fantasy. And so I kind of tuned out just for a second because I thought, yeah, you know, another fantasy, whatever, who cares. But it turned into this weird double fantasy where like the camera is on Adam's face and then it'll pan over to the woman and it's Chelsea and then it'll come back to Adam and then pan back and it's Sharon. And it was so representative of the way that Adam truly feels. He's caught in between loving two women and wanting two women. Chelsea's standing there all beautiful in the red dress and then it's Sharon all beautiful in the red dress and it was an, it was a more of an interesting fantasy scene. Um, I will have to say sorry Chelsea but Sharon looked a lot better in the dress. After Victoria found out that Adam pulled a fast one and got Billy kicked out of Newman Enterprises, had, had, him, had a secret board meeting to make Adam the only CEO and then turn around and fired Billy, Victoria, of course, went and confronted Adam. And she tried to play an empathetic game with him and said, you know, you really should give Newman Enterprises back to its rightful belongers, rightful who, to whom it rightfully belongs. Give it back to Victor. You don't want to end up sitting at this desk all alone. She sees a picture of Chelsea sitting on his desk. She already knows that they're going through this divorce. So she just takes her finger and sticks it right in that wound in just the right way. It was a, a good scene between Victoria and Adam. And even though I thought, well, that is very cunning of Victoria to approach it in a way that Victor doesn't. Victor's always very forceful when he's been asking Adam Tan back the company. Victoria approached it in a more emotionally intelligent way. But at the same time, Adam pointed out to her, and I was like, hallelujah, that Victoria's lawsuit is the catalyst for everything that's going on now. It was Victoria that sued Victor for who knows how many millions of dollars, 500 million, half a billion dollars basically, got Abby and Nick on board, pretty much drained Victor's pockets to the point where he had to take the company public, which just laid it out there for the taking. That was just creating the staging ground for Jack to take it over or for someone else to take it over. And Victoria refused to take responsibility for that. It's shocking to me that she can't even see that she is at least partly responsible for her dad losing the company. I want to dismack her for that. I really did. <laughs> really, really did. But it the whole exchange kind of worked. I think on top of Sharon having urged Adam to go and make amends with his father, Adam actually does. He decides to go and visit Victor and, for crying out loud, offered him the company back on a silver platter. Victor couldn't even believe it. Victor didn't know what to think. Of course he assumed that there were going to be strings attached and that Adam had ulterior motives and I can't really blame Victor for questioning Adam's motives here and Victor went on to imply that you know why would you even want to give me the company I think you enjoy being the outcast son you enjoy being the underdog and you know it really got me thinking, and so I want to at least make sure that I make this point, because it's very easy to blame Victor, but you cannot say that Victor didn't try to give Adam a chance, that he didn't try to let him become a part of the family. I think that where Adam has trouble is in realizing what kind of family it is, because 
being Victor's son unfortunately means dealing with Victor's control freak ways. That's just what it is. You can ask Nick. You can even ask Victoria. That's what being a Newman is. And you can't say that Victor didn't invite him in. It was Adam that rejected that. And if honestly, if it was anyone who disliked Adam right from the beginning, it was Nick and Victoria, and Nikki to some extent as well. Victor invited Adam in, not only to his home, let him live with him, but invited him in to uh, Newman Enterprises. Victor tried to give him a chance to run the company. In fact, Victor was giving preference to Adam over Nick and Victoria, but Adam wanted more. He wanted more to prove, and that's when the feud began. So you can't exactly say that 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 Victor threw the first punch. I was watching, I remember it quite clearly, and Adam was the one who threw the first punch. Now, Victor should have been a bigger man. He should have been a father instead of an enemy, but Victor only knows two modes. You know, either you are an ally or you're an enemy, and there's no gray area at all. And now, Adam, tr wanting his father's love again, possibly even realizing that he kind of was the one that threw the first punch, Adam is now at Victor's condo, offering him back Newman Enterprises like a lamb at the slaughter. I mean, even the way that the, the scene was filmed, it had Adam sitting down on the couch and Victor standing up, kind of towering, you know, looking down at him, and it really represented what the power dynamic was. Adam was the one with the control. He had what Victor wanted and is offering it to him, yet Adam was lower. You know, he was um, kind of crouched down and Victor was, you know, seemed to have the power in the scene. And Adam just looked so sad little boy so love me daddy please love me daddy and he even said i'm offering you something that your children never could that your other children couldn't i got newman enterprises back for you and if if adam's line all along had been i'm doing this for you to repair our relationship then maybe victor would have taken it but that's just not the case. Adam and Victor had a really contentious relationship this entire time, and Victor was, uh, I'm sorry, Adam was on Jack's side. Adam, I think, his first kind of, you know, his first preference was to help Jack, not Victor. So why would Victor uh, accept the deal? I mean, out of nowhere, Adam is willing to give Victor his company, and all he really wants is appreciation in return? Uh, I, I just don't know. I, I just don't, I am not at all surprised that Victor practically spit on it. Just said, eh, no thank you. I'll get the company back on my own. Which immediately Adam was rejected. He felt rejected and he just stood back up and now it's an eye to eye conversation or, or yeah, I love this scene. I thought this was good. This is my favorite part of the week was that scene with Victor and, and Adam. Now they're, you know, man to man and I thought, oh boy, this is just going to add fuel to the fire. If you thought the feud was bad before, it was convoluted because Jack was involved. Now it's Victor versus Adam. No holds barred. Ugh. Adam just looked at Victor and said, you know, I'm younger than you. I'm smarter than you. And I am more ruthless than you could ever be. And to boot, I've got nothing to lose. So I am going to one up you. I'm going to keep the company and you can just try to pry it out of my hands. And Victor, you know, of course, comes back and is like, you ain't got nothing. You were just the kid and I am the master and I'm going to get the company back. And it's created the, a, a battle royale between Victor and Adam over Newman Enterprises. And what I'm curious to know from you is who do you want to win? What is your ideal outplay of this storyline? Like, are you hoping that Victor or Adam comes out on top? And, you know, I 
there's something in me that feels like the balance of the show would be thrown off if anything happened other than Victor winning. It's always been Victor victorious all of the time. So there's a part of me that I, I can't see Victor being out. I can't see Victor losing. I, even when he does lose, it's only very, very temporary. So I don't know. I, I'm putting my bet on Victor, to be honest. I think that he, I think he, I think Adam has possibly miscalculated. <laughs> um, I think Victor's got a little something up his sleeve. But I am curious to hear what you guys have to say about that. Um, Adam, after this confrontation, goes back to his office and calls Sharon. He needs to see Sharon. And he asks her to help him go up against Victor. He says, I tried. I took your advice and I tried to give it back to him. He didn't want it. And now we have no choice but to go to battle with him. And I want to know, are you here with me? Will you fight with me? And Sharon, of course, says yes. She wants to keep her job. She wants to prove herself. And so she's willing to help stay there with Adam and steer the ship as long as she has to. Now, the X factor is Mason. He is the mole on the inside. He is, in every sense of the word, a tool. He is such a tool of Victor because ugh, ugh, Victor calls Mason and he comes running and he says that he's got information for him. You know, he's, he's keeping an eye on Sharon and, and what Victor really wants is to find out what Sharon's medication is because it has occurred to him that she's the only thing that Adam has. She is the only thing that's keeping him grounded. And if he can get to Sharon, then he can get to Adam. And I think he's right. I really do. Uh, and I, it scares me to think of what's going to happen because I feel fairly certain that, ugh, ugh, that Mason is going to help Victor find out what medication Sharon is on and switch it. And let me tell you, I hate that. I am so glad that Nikki and Jack had a moment of tenderness this week. Jack goes to visit Nikki at the condo to say thank you for putting a muzzle on Victor and not letting him go to the press about my problems. There was still obviously a, a love and a respect between them and Nikki said, you know, there was a time when I loved you and I still want to protect you and I didn't think that it was right that Victor was going to exploit your illness. I understand if anyone understands. And they were embracing. <laughs> when Victor walks in, ooh, you know that made him mad. He's walking into his own house and his worst enemy, one of them, is hugging up on his wife. Ooh, he was so ticked. And I I honestly think, <laughs> in his heart of hearts, Jack loved that. <laughs> Jack was probably tr embracing her uh, like the entire time he was there, just hoping that Victor would walk in the door with one eye on the door. Or, or maybe he was waiting until the key got into the, the keyhole and he heard it like jiggling and then he went and grabbed Nikki just so that that situation could occur. <laughs> I thought that was good. But Victor chose not to make a scene and Jack left and then there was a, a few moments between Victor and Nikki kind of alone at the condo and like all throughout this week's show something is on Nikki's mind and we heard her get the phone call last week from someone saying I know I haven't told him yet and now she's she's very uh, high strung and she's unsure and something is wrong and there's been a lot of speculation of course between you know amongst fans as to what it is that's wrong and I really think it's something wrong with Victor I don't think there's anything wrong with Nikki I think she somehow is aware of a medical condition or something that he doesn't know he has. I mean, it, a lot of it is I'm just paying close attention to the things that are being said and just the way things are being said. Because, like, Adam said something about Victor would rather die than give me any kind of respect. Which, and then Nikki had said a couple of things like, I don't want this situation with Adam to cause you to die, you know, or, or I don't want this to, you know, give you problems. Or, but there's sort of in the dialogue an implication that this 
uh, rivalry between Victor and Adam is going to somehow give Victor a medical issue. And I'm this is what I'm wondering. I'm wondering if Adam is going to give <laughs> like the, they're they're gonna, like Victor's going to have a heart attack or something maybe caused by a confrontation between he and Adam. I don't know because it's got to be something medical. Nikki also received a letter in the mail this week, which I think has to be test results. I really think it's test results. Victor came down and she very quickly hid the letter from him and then told him that she wants to postpone the wedding. Even said it to Victoria. She's telling people she doesn't feel like she has enough time to plan, which is clearly a lie. Something is up. I think that Victor is sick. I think he is going to need a surgery and that's why she doesn't want to get married because she knows he's going to need to have the surgery within the next couple of weeks or something. And what what I'm almost wondering <laughs> is, is it possible that Victor is sick and he needs a kidney or <laughs> some tissue or something? And is it possible that maybe Adam will be the only one who is a match? Maybe his worst enemy, son, will be the only one who can save him? I never thought about it until this week, but because Victor gave Stephanie this huge amount of money, I'm sure, to proposition Jack, Victor probably indirectly bought Stephanie's final drug round. He probably gave her so much money that she just went out and went on a drug spending spree and took too much and just went nuts. Which I'm not saying that Victor is responsible for Stephanie's death. Stephanie is responsible for Stephanie's death if she overdosed. But I thought that was an interesting point to be made and I think it was kind of implied a little bit by the congressman, Congressman Wheeler, Stephanie's father, who is now spending a lot of time in Genoa City and he realizes that, yes, Jack was responsible in some way for his daughter's death, but, well, I guess not responsible, but involved, I guess, and more so that Victor was involved. And the congressman realizes, furthermore, that this should entitle him to a favor from Victor. So the congressman is blackmailing Victor and tells him, I am not going to tell the world that you hired her to proposition Jack and set this chain of events into motion if you talk to Avery I hear she's she's a lawyer on your staff or or you're, you're connected with her I want you to find Avery Bailey Clark and get her to stop working on a murder case that she's working on for the Innocence Foundation so we all know right as soon as Avery came into town she takes on pro bono cases to help people who have been wrongfully accused. And so she's working on a case, she was actually out of town for it last week, and whatever this case is that she's working on, Congressman Wheeler has some sort of interest in keeping this person in jail and getting Avery off the case. So Congressman Wheeler pressures Victor to get her to stop which I don't know how Victor's gonna do that. He invites Avery over and he's he's buttering her up, asking her questions about her work and, and saying really nice things to her about you know the work that she does. And Avery, he, he tried to pry a little bit about what the case is and Avery gave up that it was a man in jail of, who has been there for 12 years over a murder that he didn't commit and she believes very strongly that the he didn't commit the murder and that he's gonna get off the hook and Victor was just so light-footed during the whole thing he didn't pressure her in fact he probably could have pressured her and forced her to get off the case but I think that Victor would way rather get one up on Wheeler instead. He'd rather know why the congressman wants this guy to stay in jail because that's really leverage. I mean, y y you gotta believe it. Nobody is going to blackmail Victor Newman and get away with it. Like, ugh, who the hell does this man think he is? Little by little, information is trickling in on Tyler and Leslie's secret. They revealed this week that they are 
running from Congressman Wheeler or that they are um, not wanting to be recognized by him and they mentioned off the cuff what do you know it's been 12 years since they've seen them hmm been 12 years since they saw Congressman Wheeler and that guy who's in jail that Avery's defending has been there for a murder that he didn't commit for 12 years hmm he thinks it's connected <laughs> so uh, Tyler runs into the congressman at the athletic club and he does this little thing where he tries to see if the congressman recognizes him. He just pulls up a bar stool, sits next to him, and starts chatting him up to see if the congressman realizes who he is, but it's been 12 years. I mean, Tyler's young anyway. What is he, in his 20s? I mean, 12 years ago, he was a kid. So the congressman mentioned, you know, he looked a little familiar, but was not able to put his finger on exactly where he knew Tyler from. So Tyler's very egotistical, strong, full of himself personality and uh, air about him is starting to slowly unravel. Slowly we're starting to see some more weakness in him. And of course, the uh, prime example of that was the old stuck in the elevator routine. <laughs> I wish somebody knew a running count of the amount of times that people have gotten stuck in the elevator together. My goodness, when are they going to get those elevators fixed? How, how common is it that elevators get stuck? I've been in many elevators, never been stuck in one, yet there's dozens of them at the Newman Enterprises Towers. How many elevator stucks are there per year? Somebody needs to get the statistics on that. But, of course, it was Tyler and Lily stuck in the elevator together. And it was, you know, it was actually a little bit endearing because Tyler immediately began to have a panic attack. He revealed that he is claustrophobic and Lily is trying really hard to calm him down and she actually did a really good job of calming him down. He collapsed a little bit onto the floor with a heavy chest and not really able to breathe and it started to show more of Tyler's weak side, you could see that something had happened to him that had caused him to have this panic attack feeling. And almost that maybe, you almost got a sense that maybe his over you know, embellished ego is an, an overcompensation for being a scared little boy at some point because he, d he did open up and say that all he really said was that there was something he saw that he was not supposed to see. And it, he, he hid in the dark or something. And that was what kind of caused the claustrophobia. It was actually the most connected that I've ever felt to Tyler. I got a little bit of a glimpse that there's more. You know, it's not just the ego. There's more to, to it. So, meanwhile, Leslie is connecting with Neil. And he's trying to understand who she is, why she's acting all shady, because she saw Congressman Wheeler at the athletic club and ran around and tr ran the other way, turned around and ran the other way. So Neil knows something's kind of up with her and she's trying her best to hide it, but he did manage to drag out of her that her father was abusive. Her mother's dead and her father was abusive. So some of the pieces of the puzzle are starting to fit together a little bit Obviously, it's Leslie and Tyler's dad who is in jail. Um, and, you know, it's weird. Just on a side note, how are you guys feeling about Leslie? Because the more I've become connected to Tyler, it's weird. I feel less connected to Leslie. I don't know why. I, maybe it's because she has just kind of lying to Neil and he's really trying and she's pushing him away a little bit. And they made love this week. And I just don't know how I how I feel about it. I'm not sure, but you know, whatever. She needs Neil. Neil Neil falls in love so quickly. They're getting so serious so quickly, but I don't know. I think that maybe the dad, Leslie and Tyler's dad, was involved in business, maybe dirty dealings with the congressman. Uh, maybe the mom got killed over it. Maybe the congressman uh, set up 
Leslie and uh, Tyler's dad to take the fall for whatever the dirty dealings were, but I, I, I'm not, I, like, and that would make sense as to why the congressman would want him to stay in jail, and if he was abusive, that makes sense as to why Leslie and Tyler would want him to stay in jail, but I'm not quite so sure as to why Avery is convinced that he is innocent. Is he just playing her, or is it possible? I mean, how can you, if he's abusive, he's abusive. Like, you don't imagine that. But I, I, I don't know if uh, if Avery is just being duped into thinking the guy is innocent, or if there's somehow he's been wrongfully, I don't know, who knows? Like, Avery could be completely wrong about this guy. It's not the first time who she's that she's gotten somebody out of jail who didn't deserve it. Daisy is out walking free because of Avery. We are getting closer, ever closer, to the underground reopening. And I thought it was really nice this week to see Nick and Sharon together. Nick was giving Sharon a tour of the place, and they were talking about their kids and, of course, their concern for Noah. And just Sharon was like, I'm really happy that you're doing so well. And, gee, could anything come in and rock your world, such as Dylan? <laughs> Dylan, his face was revealed this week. We, we've seen the shadowy figure. I'm so excited. Like, there, it's been a lot of not really knowing how that is going to fit in, but now we've seen him. He looks like a sad, you know, soul. He's doing a lot of writing in his journal. Every time we turn around, he's writing in his journal or looking in his journal or he's drinking, he's drinking some water, having a nightmare. The guy's always drinking water. He's always got, have you noticed? He's always got like three or four bottles of water sitting around him. Like he's a very thirsty guy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know exactly what his story is, clearly, but is there, I don't know if it's connected, but is there any way he could somehow have been involved in the murder case that Avery's working on? Could he know anything about that, or is this storyline totally separate? This is like an Avery's personal life storyline. I don't know, but I don't know what... Dylan knows. I don't know if Dylan knows who he is, but he knows who Avery is. He's carrying around a picture of her inside of his journal, and he's looking at it, and he obviously really likes blondes. Because <laughs> uh, we'll see if, a, a, if he can't have Avery, maybe another blonde will do. He ran into Sharon, literally, or Sharon ran into him, at the coffee house this week, and the way he looked at Sharon was as if he was really happy about it. Like, he was happy that she ran into him. Woohoo! <laughs> a blonde! <laughs> a beautiful, beautiful woman runs into me. That's all right by me. <laughs> it was kind of a funny scene. And we're starting to learn a little bit more about him. He's been hanging around town at the coffee house. He talked to Eden a little bit as well. Um, she mentioned... A, she was asking him about his journal, what he was writing in, and, and he said... Something about, you know, I, I'm very forgetful. I'm writing in it because I'm very forgetful. And that made me think, does he have amnesia? Does whatever happened to him when he was in the service, did it cause him to have amnesia? Um, and so he didn't know who he was, so he was presumed dead, and he's just now starting to put the pieces together, and that's why he's in Genoa City looking for Avery. Um... He's, in fact, he's calling himself Mac. He introduced his, introduced himself to Sharon and Eden and, ever, and everyone else as Mac, um, which maybe is a nickname. I'm not exactly sure, but he goes to the underground. And I'm sure that he was kind of going there to either see if Avery was there or check out the competition because he knows that Avery and Nick are involved. He starts to ask Nick if he needs any help, uh, you know, with electrician. He's an electrician. He can do some wiring and stuff around. Uh, and Nick says, no, I don't really need any of that help, but I am looking for a bartender. So Dylan gets a job being a bartender at the underground, and he's trying to pry Nick. He's asking him a lot of questions about the women in his life and clearly trying to get a cue as to how serious he and Avery are. And meanwhile, he's made a drink for Nick uh, to try to show him his skills. And it's a drink that he invented called the Ripcord.
Well, Nick takes a sip of it. He's fine. It's great, you know. The, he um, Dylan ends up kind of leaving, and Avery comes in. Like, Dylan and Avery sort of cross paths. Dylan leaves just as Avery gets there, and there's a moment where Nick tells Avery about the new bartender, says his name is Mac, and that seemed to ring a little bit of a bell, and then there was this ripcord drink, and Avery was like, really? It's called the ripcord? Kind of reminds me of something I used to drink in my younger days. And then she tastes it, tastes the same. And in her mind, she's probably thinking, well, this is a weird coincidence. Just wait. It's going to get way, way worse. Because Dylan goes back to his room and he pulls out of a drawer an engagement ring. He, this poor guy has clearly come looking for his woman. It's been so long. Who knows how long it's been? But they were in love and he's been through something. Something not good. And the only thing he seems to really f like know for sure is Avery and that he wants her. And he's looking at this little ring. And it was so cute. Like The, it, the ring <laughs> was a much smaller diamond than we're used to seeing on this show. <laughs> Usually, anytime a guy pulls out a, a ring, it's like, BAM! A rock! And this was kind of a small little conservative diamond, and that made me like him more! I was like, oh, he probably spent every dime he had on that ring just wanting to get his woman. It made me sad. Um, and it's, they continue to, um, like, miss each other. Um, uh, Dylan goes back to the club to get a little bartending practice, goes off into the back room, and Avery shows up. They're actually there at the same time and she and Nick start smooching face. Dylan sees it and sneaks out the front door although he left his journal on the counter. He left his um, private personal thoughts there. I don't know if anyone is going to find the journal or not. I'm really curious to know what's in the journal but it, it's, it's clearly coming to a head. They're not going to dodge each other for very long. In the previews for Monday's show there was a scene where Dylan's there in his underground branded shirt getting ready to be a bartender and Avery sees him for the first time and I think he even says like Avery so they're they're clearly getting ready to meet and I I love this I really love it I like the guy who's playing uh, Dylan in my head I want to keep calling him Jason because he's Jason from General Hospital but I, I think oh, his last name's Burton I can't think of what his first name is but um I could be wrong on that. I don't know. But I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it. I want to see where this is going to go. Is he going to cause a problem, uh, problem in Avery and Nick's relationship? Or is he going to move on? And, you know, is that I'm sure that's got to connect in with Sharon somehow. The therapist is telling her to date, and now she's running into a hunky man at the coffee house. It's only a matter of time on that one. And I am really excited to see it. Noah is playing a very dangerous game, and I don't know who's more dangerous, uh, Detective Chavez or Adriana, because Adriana pretty much guessed that Noah had been working with Chavez. She, just by the, some of the things that Noah had said, information that he had that she didn't give to him, she realized that she, he's been talking with the detective, and then he kind of gives her one kiss and she's back on his side. Like, it's a weird dynamic between them. But Adriana is no dummy. I think she's quite cunning, actually. She also guessed that Kevin and Chloe had the money, that they were the ones that stole the money from Noah's house. So she starts nosing around the coffee house, trying to figure it out. She starts working on Eden and pretends that she's looking for a place to live and Eden lets slip that there's a place by Kevin and Chloe's house. What do you know? It's the big mansion on the corner of yada and yada. So it was an interesting scene actually between Adrian and Eden and I wanted to mention that I never thought about it, but Adriana is kind of the new Eden in a way in Noah's life. It used to be Noah and Eden. They were all about each other, and now he's found another kind of other dark-haired beauty in Adriana. But anyway, Adriana finds out, puts two and two together on where Kevin and Chloe live, and um, she goes to their house, and she steals the money. <laughs> you gotta hand it to her. The girl is pretty cunning. It was sad though because Kevin 
actually had one brief moment where it looked he thought everything was going to be okay. He actually felt comfortable in his life, felt like, oh, we're finally going to have plenty of money left over. The day has been saved. And all of that just got crushed. It is no more. Not only do Kevin and Chloe not have the money that came from the bag, but they now have a second loan that they took out. They took out a second loan so that they could launder the stolen money and now they're broke and they have another loan, which is horrible. But did you guys notice that Chloe kind of tried to blame Chelsea for that because it was Chelsea's idea that that's how they do it. And as soon as the money got stolen, Chloe kind of snapped back at Chelsea and I thought, screw you. You are all too happy to take credit for Chelsea's idea and it didn't work out because you guys apparently didn't have the money in a safe. It's Chelsea's fault. I don't know. That just bothered me. Why did they just have a duffel bag hanging out at their house? Why didn't they have it tucked away so that a stranger couldn't just come in and find it? That, I mean, Kevin and Chloe have not been the most brilliant conspirators throughout this entire thing. So I guess they kind of deserve what they got. And Adriana is super proud of herself right now. She's very glad that she got that money. She's prancing around, prancing around with the duffel bag, goes to Noah and tells him that she wants to run away. She wants them to go off to a beach somewhere and just live cozy as if Noah would even blink an eye over a couple of hundred thousand dollars. He's probably got million dollar, millions of dollar trust funds. Both of his parents have done pretty well in life, I think. So they've got money. What's the, why, why does he need her? And even me, if I came into a, a couple, like a couple hundred thousand dollars, I would never be like, yes, never have to worry about money again. That doesn't go that far. A hundred thousand dollars isn't gonna go that far. So I don't know, I, I'm surprised that Adriana is even waiting around for Noah because I just get the feeling that she's using him, that she wants him because he's there and because he's being kind to her, but it, it wouldn't shock me at all if she just ran away and left him. Once she got the money, I thought, well, what are you still doing here? I mean, I, I don't know. I don't get it. And I, furthermore, I don't get why Noah is even giving her the time of day. Like, he knows that she's not trustworthy. She's obviously a liar. She's been lying to him. But at the same time, he cares about her. He really, really cares about her for some reason. She is ready to bolt. She wants to leave town. Noah convinces her to stay and actually convinces her to give him the money to hold on to for safekeeping, which she does. The second she walks out of the door, Noah makes a painful call to Detective Chavez, to Alex, and tells him, I need to see you right away. Can you come over to my house? And it was, I really liked Noah in that moment because you could tell it was killing him, that he had to lie and he didn't want to, that he had to backstab her and he didn't want to. And oddly, by the time that Alex got over to the house, Noah was dodging him. Noah didn't answer the door just kind of scooted out the back with the bag of money. I, I, no one needs to like make up his mind here. I can't figure out whose side he's on. Jack is back where he belongs, I think. He's back at Jabot in his office, in his chair. But as soon as he walked in his office and went over to his chair, I thought, mm, remember the time you threw that chair out the window? <laughs> Those were the good old days. But Jack comes up with his briefcase, opens it up, and takes out a picture of John and sets it right in front of him. And just as that happens, John appears and is really very complimentary toward Jack. Tells him he's done a good job and, in fact, says that he's proud of him. Which I almost wonder if that's the first time John's ghost has ever said that to Jack. Because it seems like mostly when Jack sees John, it's when he's doing something wrong. Or, you know, John is the representation of Jack's conscience. So it's, it's rare that he sees 
John and John is paying a compliment and it, it was a nice moment. Um, John told Jack that he's done the right thing and now the next step for him is to bring the family back together. Reunite the Abbots. Yes! That's exactly what needs to happen. <sighs> Jack hired Billy to come work with him at Jabot. I He's got Kyle working there with him. I wish upon wishes, wish, wish, wish that Ashley would come back, but I know that that's not going to happen. But instead, Abby is going to be coming back soon. We know that Marcy Ryland has been cast onto the show, so I'm assuming that she's going to come in and, and work at Jabot too. I think that makes sense. I like seeing the Abbots at Jabot. It's what makes sense. But now there is still still the small matter of the Winters family who have been running Jabot. Jack calls a meeting and everybody pretty much but Tyler comes in to, well, the executives, they're the executives, <laughs> okay, to talk about the future of Jabot and, and what the plan is. And Jack wants to reassure everyone that they're going to have jobs, but he's pretty much given Neil the position of heading up the new fashion div division at Jabot, which Neil seems excited about. I mean, I... I don't, I still feel like Neil kind of made a mistake in leaving Chancellor. Neil was running the show at Chancellor, but I guess it wasn't as exciting. A fashion division at Jabot is probably a more exciting job. I don't know what Neil's title is. It certainly isn't CEO, CEO but he's head honcho of this new division, which doesn't even feel stable to me. Anytime you launch something like that, there's a possibility it could fail. I'm So I don't know. He's, he's, I hope he doesn't count his chickens before they've hatched, but pretty much the Winters clan is going to be in charge of that. Um, so it's, it's like... It's like this. Jack and Billy and Kyle and Phyllis are Jabot, and Neil and Kane and Lily and Devon, probably not very long, but Leslie and I guess Poss I don't know, Leslie's a lawyer. I don't even know why she was in that meeting. She should be servicing the whole company. And I guess Tyler, some, I guess those are the people that are going over to work at the new fashion division, which I'm excited to know what its name is going to be because I need to have something to call it. But it seems, I guess on the surface, like it's working out. Um, the only person that I think is really getting the short end of the stick here is Kane. And Kane was the whole CEO of Jabot, and now Jack just comes back and gives a higher position to Neil, and Kane's just sort of an underling again? I can't imagine how long that's going to last. Slowly but surely, Chloe and Chelsea's fashion business is starting to form. They haven't really done a heck of a lot, but it's it's still kind of in its inception. And Gloria is now back from her a little stint of owning a horse race, a horse, a racing horse with Jeff, and she's decided since that didn't work out, she wants to now be a part of Chloe and Chelsea's business, and she's really getting up in it, selling herself, saying that she knows what women want, and she, everything she does is successful, <laughs> with the exception of about a hundred things. <laughs> But her businesses have always been successful, so she wants to get in on the ground floor with these girls, which I'm all for. I dig it. I like Gloria. And Chelsea, I think, probably didn't want it to happen until Gloria started talking about the fact that her business got burned down, and Chelsea knows damn well that her husband is the one that had that was behind it. So Chelsea feels guilty, decides to agree to let Gloria in on the business, and Chelsea and Chloe are working on buying the Restless Style building. I guess I, I never really fully conceptualized that Restless Style was gone. I, there was rumblings that Billy was going to sell the business, but... Apparently it's sold and no longer working because the building is empty. Um, Chelsea goes by to check it out. She's the one with the money, after all. And she meets Billy there to talk about buying it. And Billy, the dynamic between Chelsea and Billy was very different. Billy has been so sympathetic towards Chelsea as if she didn't dupe him into a pregnancy, as if there's not a whole lot of bad history there. He was just being really sympathetic toward her and the divorce that she's going through, and he's kind of doing a lot to encourage her 
to stay around. He's aware of the new fashion division that's going to happen at Jabot, and he's looking for a designer. So he's he's kind of trying to lead her in that direction to get her to stay around. And as soon as Victoria found out about this, she was like, what? Why would you want to keep her around? And I have to tell you, I think Victoria is right to be concerned. Every time Victoria expresses a concern about Chelsea being around Johnny, Billy kind of plays it off as if he's ours, don't worry about it. But I'm sorry, sooner or later, Chelsea's very existence is going to punch a hole in Billy and Victoria's little fantasy life. Chelsea is Johnny's mother. And Johnny is going to want to know her. And on some level, especially now that Chelsea has been divorced from Adam, lost their child, she's going to want to know who Johnny is. She's going to at least be curious. If I was Victoria, I would want Chelsea as far away from me and my child as possible. I think that's very, very natural. But Billy... <sighs> He seems just like way too sympathetic to her and he, or to Chelsea, and he tells Victoria, you know, that he's thinking about hiring her or getting her in at Jabot. Why go to the trouble to get Chelsea in on the business and act like, oh, Chelsea and Chloe are really going to help us out at Jabot? Yeah, they're real innovative. And then why not suggest Victoria? Victoria's unemployed. I mean, she's got her hands full, of course, at Newman, but why Why not get Victoria involved somehow at Jabot? It's weird. Everybody's acting like Chelsea is some kind of genius now. I... It, Every time anyone, I know I need to get over this, but every time anyone refers to Chelsea grifting in the past, I have to just roll my eyes as far as they can go back in my head because it's so stupid. Chelsea was talking this week about how, you know, when she was on the grift with her mom, she would be hovered under her covers at night drawing pictures. It's... It's the whole, like, on the grift. Nobody would say that. Who would even say that? That, that whole con artist thing does not fit Chelsea, does not fit who she is now or who they're trying to make her be. Maybe if they would have had her continue to be a con artist when she came into town. I mean, obviously she did when she first got into town. But if they would have continued along that line, maybe I'd buy it. But they've totally painted her like a little angel princess. So every time she says it, I'm just like, bleh. And... And everybody's totally impressed with her design. She's untrained, but she's self-taught. And the second that Billy mentions Chelsea is a really great designer, Kane's eyebrow kind of went up. After that last week at the athletic club when Chelsea was eyeballing Kane and then he went over to hand her, her his handkerchief after she knocked over her glass of tea, there seems to, there's something there. Like, I think... Kane was kind of checking her out, and I can't believe it. Like, they sent, Jibo sent Kane over to Restless Style to meet with Chelsea. Of course, Lily was supposed to be there, but she got caught in the elevator. <laughs> and Kane meets with Chelsea, and he's really complimentary. He even said stuff like, I'm here to make your dreams come true. <sighs> Kane knows that she's into him, I think, and he likes it. I think Kane, I think his eye is wandering a little bit, and Chelsea's eye is definitely wandering too. Uh, Anita, Chelsea's mom, comes into the scene. Blech, I hate her. I cannot stand her. Uh, I hate looking at her. She comes into the scene, and Kane bends over to pick up a business card that he's dropped, and they both totally check out his ass, which I don't blame you girls. Kane is a very, very good looking piece of ass, and I would do it too, but it was so obvious. And I just, I don't know. I don't know how to feel about this. Like, I like Lily and Kane together, and I feel that it's happening. I feel that Tyler and Lily are connecting, now especially after having got caught in the elevator, and Kane, I wonder if he's going to go to Chelsea, and I just don't know. I kind of don't like it. <laughs> Oh, what do you guys think? I mean, are you feeling Kane and Chelsea and then Tyler and Lily? Like, is it time to switch things up or are we better off with the same? Are you guys noticing that Catherine seems to be experiencing some memory loss? Ugh, I'm not happy about this. I don't like any 
indications of Catherine having health issues. It, I don't like it. I dread the day that her character dies. I have been watching Bold and the Beautiful and I have just gone through Stephanie's death and I don't want to have to go through it on YNR. I don't want to have my heart ripped out, but it's happening. She's having memory loss. She, there was a scene where Kane shows up at the mansion and they're sitting in the living room and she's clearly forgotten things that they've already discussed and she's trying to play it off like, oh, yeah, why don't you just refresh my memory? I've had a long day. It's, it's not looking good. And then Tucker walks in on their conversation, just like opens the door and walks on in and they're both like, what do you do? You just walk on in here now? And he says, no, I got invited. You told me to come here. And she didn't remember it. She, like, passively blamed Esther <laughs> for not telling her that Tucker was coming. But no! Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Not good. I don't like it. Um, and I dread to know where that is going. But more importantly, we saw the end of Tucker this week. I would love to hear from some people who are sad about that. I really sat down and watched the scene and concentrated on it. And I did feel bad. Tucker comes to Catherine and tells her that he has to go to Hong Kong for business. Total lie. He is tired of being rejected by Devon. He doesn't feel like he has any reason to stay in Genoa City. Things have been stressful between he and Catherine. It doesn't matter if he saves Murphy's life. Murphy isn't going to forgive him. He's a pariah in this town and he chooses to leave. He chooses to bow out, which is such a sucker move. Why why bow out? Why not continue to try to connect? He's being kind of a wimp about it, but I know that the actor had to go. It's It was sad. Like, Catherine was sad. She did she, The look on her face when Tucker told her that he was leaving was like, it was the last time they were going to see each other. And I, I wish things could have been different for Tucker. I wish things could have been different for Tucker and Catherine. Like, his whole downfall, his whole mistake was letting Ashley go. Ashley was the best part of him and she kept him on the straight and narrow and as soon as their relationship broke up, I stopped liking him at all. And, it, it, you know, I used to like him a lot. If you can go back and listen to my earlier um, vlogs, I, I, I love Tucker a lot and it was a really sad final scene. Um, he told Catherine, I just want you to know that I forgive you for everything that happened in my childhood. And just as he left, just as he was walking out the door, Catherine just sort of stuttered, sort of stumbled. She goes, I... And you could tell that she almost said, I love you or I forgive you, but she didn't. She stopped herself and she held back. And I don't... I don't know why. The feud between Jamie and Fenn is causing major problems in Michael and Lauren's relationship. All they do is argue now. Uh, Lauren cannot even handle the mild implication that her son may have been involved in harming a another human being. And Michael, on the other hand, is trying to be very realistic about it. Michael's a DA. His job, and, and, and before that, he was just, you know, a lawyer. Like, his job is to ferret out the truth from a situation. And so his eyes are not closed. He is not uh, automatically assuming that his son is innocent in what happened to Jamie. And Lauren gets so upset with Michael that she leaves him. She's like, I just have to get out of here. She goes to the club, sits at the bar, where who is bartending yet again? Carmine. And he's doing a real good job of being charming. He's trying to cheer her up and just be all in all a smooth, suave guy. He even opened up a $1,500 bottle of wine for her. He stole that wine. Like, she wasn't going to pay $1,500, and he was sort of toying her with it, like, oh yeah, we got a fancy wine here, wouldn't you like to try it? Next thing you know, he just opens it up and says, you know, I won't get in trouble, I'll just say, it looked a, it looked a little off to me, the color was off to me, and so, uh, you know, I mean, come on! You just stole a $1,500 bottle of wine, kind of to impress Lauren? I don't 
trust him. And I don't know what's going to happen between them, but I swear, I swear to you, if Lauren ends up having an affair with Carmine or something, I'm going to scream. I'm going to holler <laughs> that it's unacceptable. Ah. <sighs> well, I don't know what's going to happen. Michael ended up finding her at the club, and she left uh, with him, and they come home. And next thing we know, Jamie is home from the hospital and he's sitting in Michael and Lauren's living room and Paul and Michael and Lauren are questioning him about what happened and Lauren immediately poisons the well and tells Jamie to not lie about it to stop lying about it you know tell us, go ahead and tell us that Finn had nothing to do with your fall which immediately changed the dynamic of the questioning now Jamie is gonna feel bad Either way, he can't really tell the truth, and he can't really lie. And all of a sudden, Fen interrupts the questioning, just, of course, as Jamie's probably about to open up. And he busts in the room and tells Jamie to, he says, tell him the truth. Go ahead, tell him the truth, that I had nothing to do with this. And I just don't know what the truth is. I still don't know. I mean, Paul, Jamie runs out of the room, and Paul you know, follows him and they go to the coffee house and Paul tries to talk to Jamie about what happened when Summer interrupts and, you know, she ad admits that she, of course, was Brittany and she started this whole chain of events into motion and she's sorry for it, but that she didn't want that to happen to Jamie and she cares about him. And Jamie, she asks Jamie, she wants to know, what, did Fen have anything to do with pushing you off the roof? Was that Fen? And Jamie says to Summer, yeah, Fen is responsible, but so are you. He didn't say that Fen pushed him. He just said that they were responsible. And I thought that was an interesting way to word it. Why isn't Jamie just being honest? Why isn't he saying what happened? I find this to be a little suspect. Um, Michael and Lauren, Lauren ends up interrupting um, at the coffee house and really accuses Jamie, kind of calls him a liar. And unfortunately, Michael and Lauren have got it in their head and are preoccupied with the idea that Jamie is going to press charges against Fenn. Well, where did that come from? Lauren mentioned it, that Jamie might ruin Fenn's life, and then later back at the apartment, Michael had a moment alone with Jamie and again said, you know, I just want to know, are you going to press charges against Fen? Fen? Which totally just planted the seed in the kid's mind. He wouldn't think of that otherwise. I thought, well, that's like the stupidest thing you could have said. And there, in this moment, uh, Michael and Jamie are trying to talk. Michael leaves the room and Fen comes in and confronts Jamie one-on-one -on -one, and Jamie just explodes and grabs Fen and pushes him up against the wall. Michael walks in on that. Of course, he sees Jamie kind of attacking Fen and Jamie just exploded and said, he did it. He tried to kill me. Finally, this was him saying something directly about it. And Lauren had come in in this situation, and, like, Lauren is standing by and behind Fen, and Michael is standing behind Jamie, and it's creating this horrible, like, teams. Like, it's Lauren and Fen versus Jamie and Michael, and I, I, I don't know what the truth is, because, to be honest with you, even though I know that Fen is a jerk and I can't stand him, like I can't even stand looking at him, but I don't necessarily think that he pushed Jamie off the roof. There's a part of me that thinks this is Jamie's last straw, that Jamie is tired of being bullied around and now here there is an opportunity to get back at Fen. I just wonder if this is just Jamie's turn for revenge. Okay, you guys, that's the end for me for this week, but it's just the beginning for you. Leave me a comment and let me know what you're thinking about this week's show. I really enjoyed it. I was very in tune. Like I was, I watched every single show very intently all week. And I think there's, it's starting to hit a little bit of a stride. I think there are a lot of interesting things that have happened, a lot of seeds that have been planted, and I'm looking forward to seeing 
how it all develops and how it all climaxes. So how about you guys leave me a comment, let me know what you thought about this week's show, if you guys have any predictions or uh, just anything that's on your mind. I always love hearing from you. Okay, that's, that's all. I am going to get going, but I will be back next Sunday to chat again about our favorite show. So everybody have a good week. Mwah. Love ya. Bye.